there's a starting point to get us all on the same page. I'm not supposed to do this by hand, right? OK. Um, so if you look at the QED vertex corrections, also I realize there's some difficulty sometimes with reading, so please shout out if something is not readable. Um, so what are we looking at? Well, we draw many different types of bubbles in these kind of lectures. So this is a bubble that means the connected, uh, the, the one PI uh, function. So what I'm thinking of is like an electron coming in with momentum P, going out with momentum P prime, which is P plus Q. And Q is the momentum of the photon that is coupling to the electron. There is, you know that there will be some Lorentz index associated with this photon line. And how does this go? Well, at tree level, we have something like this. Um, and we have the one loop correction, which is the one that we're looking at. And then, of course, there's lots of more stuff coming after that. Um, and I want to write this as um, minus IE gamma mu. So what the, the idea is here just to represent that this is something that depends on the Lorentz index and transforms as a vector, depends on P and P prime. And this minus uh, IE is just because in the standard conventions of Pesky and Schroeder, for example, this would just be minus IE gamma mu. So now I want to isolate the corrections to gamma mu in this interaction. So, so this thing here, this function that we want to compute starts with just gamma mu, and then there comes some correction here, and we want to work out what that is. Okay. So how does this go? Well, you look up your Feynman rules, uh, you write down this thing. So this is the one we're looking at. So we had more external momenta P and P prime. Then there's momentum K and K prime. And here we have an exchange momentum um, P minus K. And then we assign some indices. Uh, so we had mu here. Um, we put mu here and rho here. And then what is this? What are we supposed to do? Well, we have to integrate over Minkowski space. I'm in the mostly minus uh, convention. We have the loop integral, the loop momentum to integrate over. And then we have lots of contributing terms. We have a photon propagator, which I take in the simplest possible gauge. For a massless photon. Then we have the gamma matrices back to front, and some uh, electron propagators. So this is K prime. Then we have another gamma matrix where the external photon couples. Then we have another propagator. And one more gamma matrix. So I hope this is without uh, debate. Um, and then what can we do? Well, uh, we want to factor off one of these IEs. Um, and then you do your exercise in Dirac algebra. So I'm not going to. So this is an exercise you can really do if you want. I think if you've never done this calculation before, it's probably a very good exercise. And you can use things like um, these contraction identities. Uh, and relatives of that. And you can reduce this a little bit. Because here you see we have actually five different gamma matrices in a row, and this way you can bring it down to three. Um, and you get an expression of this type. So I'll just write it down for you. K slash gamma mu k prime slash. Then we have a mass term with 
gamma mu and something which actually just depends on the loop momenta. And I just write all the denominators in one go here. Um, sorry, k minus p squared. k prime squared minus m squared, and k squared minus m squared. OK. Now, one of the complications of such a computation is that this expression has a lot of what's called tensor structure. So it's not just an integral. Um, and that is a Lorentz scalar, but we know this whole thing is a Lorentz vector, and we see here this vector index. And even more than that, there's also some non-trivial object in the spinner space, because you have these gamma matrices which act on the spinners. You know that if you evaluate this on on-shell electrons, you should actually sandwich this between your uh, spinners for the two states. Right? So this is where you should put, put this in if you evaluate it. Um, so this is one of the complications, and, and one big step before you, uh, or that is helpful to, to get rid of in the first place, is to resolve this tensor structure and boil down things to scalar integrals. Um, and in order to do that, it's helpful to have some analysis in the beginning, what is actually the potential tensor structure of this object. So we know um, that this object, gamma mu, which is just a thing without this vector here, is, is a Lorentz vector. And what are the only vectors that we have? Um, well, we have gamma mu, and we have p prime and, and p. So let me just, for the fun, uh, take them in this, these combinations here. So this is one basis of the three vectors that we have at disposal to, to build a quantity. And of course, they can come with any scalar coefficients, right? So the coefficients are now lower in scalars. And if we, if we go on the mass shell where, where we force p squared equals p prime squared equals m squared, then the only variable actually that we have is q squared. So I'll just write a of q squared. There's some multi multiple in front of gamma mu. There's some multiple which may depend on q squared in terms of p prime plus p. And we have something in terms of this one. This is just uh, the analysis of uh, this simply exploiting the fact that this is a vector. And these are the only vectors that we have. Um, then you can be a little bit cleverer. You can um, work out that um, you can use the void identity So this is somehow, you know that for this to make sense in the context of a gauge theory, you know that this should rather be um, zero. Well, actually, you don't know that. What you really know is that if you put it between on-shell external states, so if you put in the, the spinners, the u-bar of the p prime, so this is u-bar of p prime, and you put the u of p. So know that this, you know that this better be zero. And if you work out what this means, you know that it forces um, C has to be 0. These two are actually not constrained. You can check this via some identities that those will never contribute to this quantity. So this is a sign of the redundance um, that Jake has already mentioned that we have here gotten rid of explicitly by some argument. And then just to get it into the textbook form, um, it is common to replace this uh, second term in the, in the tensor structure by, um, by um, the following identity. So you can work out that there's an identity. Why is it so much better? Um, so there is a relation between this one um, and the commutator of two gamma matrices. Um, 
So here, the sigma is i over 2 times the commutator. I just write this because this is the way it's typically expressed. Um, so if you use this to replace the, the second uh, of these uh, vectors, then you know, then you conclude that the structure of this function, something like this. Um, so it's some function times gamma mu, and this is in this particular context it's called f1. And then there's an, another term which has this sigma mu nu q nu. M, and this is called F2. And this is what's called a form factor uh, decomposition. So, so these are called form factors. And you know that this is, this is the coefficient of gamma mu. Right, and in the, in the tree level theory, the coefficient is just one, or it's, it's minus IE, it's the, the charge of the particle. So this is related uh, to the electric charge or to the renormalization of the charge. So this is actually where some renormalization plays a role. This thing here is much tamer. It doesn't have divergences in the, in the first correction even. Uh, but it's related to what, what Jake mentioned, to the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. So, so what is the magnetic moment? of the electron. Well, it's the relation between the magnetic dipole moment and the spin. So if you, if you denote the dipole moment by mu as a vector, so this is not a Dimirac mu or whatever. This is a dipole moment mu. Then there's a factor called the, the g factor, uh, or long d factor in the case of the electron. Uh, then there's the charge, which plays a role, and the spin. And the question is, what is this g factor? Uh, and as Jake pointed out, on to tree level, if, if you work out what, what this really is, you find that g is 2 at tree level. And then you have a correction, which is 2 f2 of 0. Yeah, so, th so this calculation follows from, this, this value follows from the Dirac equation. And quantum electrodynamics tells you that there's correction to this, which are exactly given by this form factor here. So when you can compute uh, F2, then you know what are the corrections to this ratio. Okay. Any questions to, to that preliminary? OK. So how can we compute this explicitly? So the first step uh, is always uh, to combine denominators. What we, what we do here is, is the Schwinger trick. So consider a denominator. So you have something like 1 over d in your expression. And you know you can write this as the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus x d dx. Well, to be precise, you should rather ask that the real part is greater than 0 for this integral to make sense and converge. Um, but if you do this, uh, for all denominators, then you see they all get in the exponent, and then the product becomes a sum in the exponent. So you get something like 1 over d1, d2, d3 is um, the integral from 0 to infinity in three parameters, dx2, dx3. And then you have e to the minus q where q is just the sum of all of these exponents. Yeah, so q, it's called the universal quadric. Now it's getting worse again, I'm sorry. Universal quadric. Um, oh, it is dry. Um, so that is, um, so it's x1 times the first denominator. Um, and I take them the following order. So I take first the, uh, the first electron line, m squared minus k squared uh, minus i epsilon. 
So you notice I've changed the sign here, that, which has a reason which I explain later. But at the moment, I could have chosen any. Um, then we have the other one with k prime. Um, and then we have the photon propagator. I mean, the denominator of the photon propagator. So one uh, advantage of, the, of this kind of reformulation is that now you have one quadratic expression in the loop momentum. And you know, if you have a quadratic expression, you can complete the square, so you can rewrite it. So you see there is, this here is, this is k plus q squared, right? So this is a k squared plus 2k times q plus q squared. And similarly, you can expand this. So you have quadratic terms in the loop momentum. You have linear lerm, terms in the loop momentum. You have terms that don't depend on the loop momentum at all. But if you take everything that you have together, you can uh, repackage it and complete the square. Um, so if you do this, we, we find that we can rewrite Q um, as x1 plus x2 plus x3 times now a, a new momentum. I redefine my momentum. I completed the square. Um, and then there's a constant part where I define uh, L to be k plus x2q plus x3p x1 plus x2 plus x3. Yeah, so this makes sense because you see there's a x1 minus k squared. There's an x2 minus k squared. If you expand this, there's also an x3 minus k squared. So the first term here in the L squared gives you exactly minus k squared with all of the x's. And then if you look at one of the cross terms in the 2k dot this one, so example, you have a 2k x2q. This denominator cancels with this prefactor. So this gives you exactly this kind of term, which has the x2, and then with the minus x3. So this is how you fit the terms quadratic and linear in k. And then there's some part which you have to check, which is maybe the finite remainder. And this goes into this delta. So if you work out what this delta is to make this equation uh, an identity, you find that you can write uh, delta as um, x1 plus x2 squared m squared minus q squared x1 x2 over the sum of the three variables. I'll just keep this for later. Just want to draw a box around it. OK. So this is already progress. I, I'm sure you've all seen this before. I just wanted to um, uh, do it again here so that you believe the things I say later. <laughs> um, So this way, we have gotten rid of the entire denominator of our integral expression for the form factor. Uh, sorry, for, 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 for this function gamma for the vertex. We haven't isolated the form factor yet, right? So this is one of the first steps that we have to accomplish, um, is that we know that this integral that we've written down must be a linear combination of uh, gamma mu and this sigma mu nu vector. Um, but our integrand doesn't look like it, right? Our integrand is some cubic expression in these gamma matrices um, and doesn't have at all this, this decomposition. Um, So what you now do is you rewrite everything in terms of this momentum L of this shifted loop momentum that you used to complete the square. Um, then you can.
propagated that they exponentiate that they're not there anymore to be such that they have the minus in cos chaos as they become positive. So anyway, so with this replacement, so what happens is that we get an, get an I out, and then we just have to integrate e to the minus something Euclidean squared, which is totally fine. That's a Gaussian integral. Uh, how do Gaussian integrals work? Um, yeah, very simple. So that means that um, this integral for L e to the minus x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus L squared uh, I times d of square root of a l square root of a. So you just get the same thing with another square root of a in the denominator. Okay. And now for us, a is just the sum of these three variables. So the whole integral is just this to the fourth power, because we have four components and each integration is of this type. This is the one-dimensional integration of this Gaussian type, e to the minus l squared with some prefactor gives you square root of pi over this prefactor. The bigger a, the smaller the integral. That makes sense. And here we have four integrations, so we get this to the fourth power. So we can compute this integral. Um, and then we're left with um, f2 q squared. Um, so the minus, I had some minus i somewhere here. That goes away. So finally, we have some real expression for something that should be real. Um, so we still have these three integrations. Um, yeah, so, so this four here, remember what we did? So at first we had a square. And now we have to take this to the fourth power. So we get a pi squared over a squared. So that we get it to the fourth power in the denominator. And the pi squared cancels what I had. Some other pi squared cancels this pi squared. So you have this, and then we still have the e to the minus delta. And delta is there. OK. So now at this stage, we, we have reached what's called a parametric integral formula. So all the loop momenta have gone, all the redundancy of parameterizing loop momenta in different ways have disappeared. Um, the dimension, well, if you would do this in different dimension, it turns out the dimension only enters actually uh, secretly here. We'll talk about this tomorrow more. Um, but this is a kind of expression where you can start to use a lot of tools from, uh, from symbolic uh, manipulation techniques. You can study divergences from here. You can start talking about integration by parts relations and so on. So this is really a a very useful uh, expression for, for such an integral to have. Why do you say the loop uh, integration? Well, we've done the integral. We've done the loop integral, right? We did new integrals, yes. But I mean, we're down from four integrations to three, if you want to want to do that kind of game. Um, I think my the. the what I must, should rather say is maybe that in, in the loop momentum representation, there's an inherent ambiguity of how to parameterize the loop momentum. 
So you can write the same integral many different ways. Um, and this redundancy, at least, has disappeared at this stage. I mean, we can still, of course, to change the variables and rewrite this thing in many, many different ways. But there's a canonical way. If, if, if I ask you to do this procedure, starting from integral, you will all end up with this expression, no matter how you parameterize your initial loop momentum. This is what I wanted to say. So somehow this integrand is a well-defined thing to talk about. Maybe that's not very compelling. But you've done the integral over the loops and introduced new integrals. Maybe the, the point will be more compelling tomorrow when I talk about dimen dimension regularization, where this is an honest integral in a integer number of dimensions, even in dim rank. Whereas in, in the momentum representation, you have to wave a lot of hands. Um, okay. Believe it or not, we're still somewhat on time. So the next thing I wanted to explain just in a little bit of detail is the, uh, the exploitation of uh, homogeneity and what's sometimes called the Cheng-Wu theorem because I realized this sometimes causes some, some confusion. So I just wanted to maybe be a bit pedantic here, but I hope uh, you bear with me. So you want to do this integral. And there's one thing striking that you notice when you look at this delta, how it depends on the axis. There's a numerator which is quadratic in the axis and a denominator which is linear in the axis. So the whole thing is actually homogeneous in the axis. Also, this factor here is homogeneous in the axis. And it's trivially clear that everything has to be homogeneous from the first place because this quadratic that I wrote was x1 times the first denominator, x2 times the second denominator. So it was linear in the first place. Everything that derives from it has to be homogeneous. And you can exploit this to, to do one of the integrations. So how do we do this? Um, so um, let's, let, me, let, me call me, let me call this here, let me call this here little f f of x, and then we have homogeneity so we know that, so suppose we multiply all x's with some parameter lambda, then this prefactor is quadratic in the numerator, quartic in the denominator, so we get a lambda to the minus 2 f of x, and we know that the delta is linear. So if we plug in lambda x into delta, we just get lambda times delta of x. And you can do this, use this to do one integration. So suppose we have an integral. Um, so we have an integral dx1, dx2, dx3, f of x, e to the minus lambda x. OK, that's what we have. Now let me do the following. I just write a trivial one in here, integrate from 0 to infinity, um, dt, and I put a delta distribution. t minus something, and I could put anything here, right? A any positive number I put here, this will just integrate to 1. Um, so we could even make this number that we put here depend on x. So let's put a, put a function of x here, and I'm allowing you to, yeah, where where h is a function, it takes the three Schwinger parameters um, into some positive number. This is important. Right? If, if you take any such function, then this identity will be true, that the integral is the same. I mean, the original integral is the same as this one, because this will integrate to 1. So you can take any function here. Sorry, 3. Any combination that takes three positive Schwinger parameters and gives you a positive number out of it, you can plug it there. Um, but I want to put a constraint. This is also supposed to be homogeneous. So you want to put a constraint which is linear or homogeneous of degree 1. Let's put it that way. So I want that also lambda gets out of this constraint. So suppose we have the situation. Um, then what we can do, then we can change variables. We can just rescale all the x's.
and we have another function. Now, there are many ways to choose this delta function. I was a bit more explicit in this derivation here because you could convince me that this is a very general thing. I and mean, we could integrate the Schwinger parameters over the positive part of the sphere or whatever if you take the square root. Anything that is, and you can write anything that takes positive R quad values and is homogeneous of degree 1. A common place in the physics books is to use um, just the sum of all of the Schwinger parameters. And let's do this here. I mean, if you make this choice for this homogeneous function, you set it to 1, which is convenient, right? Because you get rid of this whole term. And then you can write, essentially, this means that the x1 integration is trivialized. Um, do that. So let's try to compute f2 of 0. Well, if, if you want the sum to be 1, then obviously, each value has to be at most one, so the integral from zero to infinity gets gets um, cut off. So we're integrating x three only to one, and then we're integrating x two. Uh, x two can only be at most one minus x three because otherwise the sum would be bigger than one, and we would have no chance to choose x one in this way, which is positive. And then what what is meant of the integrand? But if I put q squared to 0, the this goes away, the mass cancels. And then you have an x3 in the numerator. This thing here cancels 1 in the denominator. So you have an x1 plus x2 down here, which is the same as 1 minus x2. Well, now it's really kindergarten, right? So this, this integral here, nothing depends on x2. It's just with 1 minus x3. <coughs> cancels the denominator. So you're left with integrating x3 from 0 to 1, which is Here, if you have another normalization of pi, something you have to 
account for some extra factors, but this is my new invention measure. And I throw the I here such that after big rotation, it just becomes the infinite positive thing. Otherwise, you throw in your preferred number of uh, power of i's. And then we have some denominators. Uh, I realize this may be bad. Yeah, I, I think let's call it. So we have n, capital N denominators, um, A, and for example, we could think of things like um, some momentum squared, some squared, uh, epsilon, right, where this P is linear combination of U and external momentum. This is a typical thing that arises. You can just write the more fancy things. What is important is that these things, after you take the square, right, these have to be quadratic expressions, and they should have after rotation about a fine sign, otherwise it cannot make sense of the intervals. But I'm not putting any constraints. I mean, these, this, this, these don't have to come from fine graph or whatever. Just take a bunch of quadratic forms and look at these kind of things. And then another thing, that in addition to raising this consider this other high dimensions maybe, is that it's also commonplace to raise these propagate these denominators to some exponents uh, to higher powers. Um, and why would you want to do this? Um, well, many people know, but there is something very important with this integration by parts, which means that if you consider not just one interval, but the entire family of intervals you get by considering different values of the ends, you can find relations between them, which can be very useful to crunch on huge expressions for scattering amplitudes at higher orders of multiplicities to a much smaller number. So you could think this is more like a technical thing why I would want to do it. Uh, integration by parts. I will talk about that on Wednesday, hopefully. Um, there's something called ISPs, which is still useful scalar products didn't play a role in our calculation because it was one loop. But you can imagine a situation where maybe in your numerator you have some dot product of some momentum which does not appear in the denominator. Then you could also say maybe you just declare this dot product to, to be, be a fake denominator with an x to the x. Then you could just easily treat it the same formalism. So this can be very convenient. Um, and this, in fact, actually used the most um, systems. Um, also, you have gauge theories and gauge fixing. Right? You know that sometimes maybe your photo propagator uh, is not just G mu nu or K squared, but you also want to add some term proportional um, to K mu, K mu over K before to check the calculation or things like that. There's another moment where this is very important. This is for one scale subintervals, which I probably won't say much about. Um, I'll probably mention this uh, tomorrow. But there are cases when you have a very simple propagated subintergral in a massless theory, which is just in a regularized setup, it's just some fractional power of the momentum, and then you can factorize off this entire subintergral. So this is very important for. Um, for renormalization group equation calculations. For example, the calculation of the beta function or counter terms. Um, this, uh, <coughs> at least some approaches to this use this quite often. Anyway, so let's suppose we want to consider such an object, which is uh, a general scalar integral. Then how do the string parameters look like? Well, the fact of the before, there's only a slight modification that um, that due to these uh, exponents here, um, you should remember what the gamma function is. So what is the gamma function? Um, you can define it as the integral of zero to infinity x to the n minus 1 e to the minus x dx. Right? So if and this is actually n is integer. Uh, this is n 
minus one of the protocol. So I could also write the corals, but because I want to talk about regularization tomorrow, let's just treat it as anything. So we can use this, and then again we just rescale, and then it follows that we take one over power of the denominator. Um, we get the same thing. Put it in the exponent. And we normalize by the gamma. Okay. So essentially what it means is that the integration measure which was previously just dx now becomes dx times x to the n minus 1 divided by gamma. So you may remember this proper formula that Johannes has uh, written down. Then we have, we have the combination of the propagators by completing the square. Um, that of course also goes to full generality. Suppose you want to treat a numerator uh, as a denominator in the way I suggested, then what you would have to do is you put the exponent n to be minus one, so that the thing is a numerator. And if you do this, of course, the, uh, this, this formula doesn't make sense. Right? If you put n to minus one, you integrate for small x as dx over x squared, this blows up. Um, so then you have to modify this formula. I expect this wrong. So there's a, if you have a negative index, you have to Plus some derivatives, but it gets a little bit old. Okay. So we combine the propagators. So whatever you have, so we have a string of parameter now for each denominator. And by definition, by requiring that, that hat have, have be it should, should be a quadratic form in the loop momentum. So you can always write this um, as, as some uh, L loop momentum as a quadratic term, which takes the products of the loop momentum. Yeah, so there, there's a little matrix which tells you which loop momentum are coupled with which. And this matrix will depend on the axis. Um, then you have terms which are linear to the momentum. So these R's will be some vectors depending on the external kinematics and the string operators. Then you have some constant. Um, and then you can always complete the square. So you can rewrite this in terms of redefine the momentum, which we have shifted. Of course, nothing will change in the quadratic term. And I will call the shifted group momentum Li and Lj, just as in our example. And then there will be no linear part, but some constant part, which we call delta. We can explicitly write what this is. So uh, Li is just Ki, and then we shift by the inverse matrix, ij, which is ours, 
this is very simple to check that in fact the same you have to use the right quadratic linear terms. And then of course you have to work about the constant is. So the constant here is the constant you had um, before uh, plus the quadratic term in this momentum that multiplies the loop momentum. So you now have the inverse quadratic form in the R. I think we just written down the computing experiments, so that's boring. Um, maybe I'll just do an example. Um, you should always keep in mind this works for any set of denominators, right? Because in most cases, you will want to do this for a graph. So let's consider two of graph like this. And P K1, we have two, two loop momenta, K2, um, two minus P, one minus P, and I have one minus K2. And then I have to tell you which order I want to treat them, so which denominator that I assign to the training for a so that we call this is one, So we can decompose this 
thing and then you can work out what delta is if you just do this computation. That's the matrix. But the point is you don't want to do it and you don't have to do it. There's a formula which tells you what it is without having to do it. But I just want to be explicit of how this works for an arbitrary set of denominators. And then it is maybe definition. So I say first definition is I define a polynomial U, which is the determinant of this matrix L, the number. It's the determinant of the matrix that describes the coupling of the loop momentum and the denominators. And second definition is I define another polynomial called F as U times delta. So think about this for a second. So lambda is a matrix whose entries are linear combinations of the Schwinger parameters. So this is clearly polynomial. Uh, and what is the degree of the polynomial? Well, the matrix is loop number times loop number. So it's a degree of loop number polynomial. Now what is delta? Well, delta is defined in terms of, uh, of the J, which is also just a linear thing. But then you have also lambda inverse, right? You have to compute lambda inverse. And if you remember the formula for the inverse of the matrix, you can write it as a minor divided by the determinant. So the inverse of the matrix will be a matrix with rational coefficients, but the rational function to the inverse of the matrix will be some polynomial divided by the determinant. So if you multiply delta with the determinant, you're going to get a polynomial. So you can always define a polynomial called u and a polynomial called f to a given collection of denominators. And these are the things that play a role in the formula. And there we are. Yes. We get one term that comes from uh, the, the linear part of substituting k as uh, well, which is the term you wrote there, like lambda minus 1 r r. Yes. Don't we have also a term coming from the quadratic part, like substituting uh, on. Uh, but this is, this is coming from the quadratic part. Mm -hmm. if, if you substitute the. the so, I, from, yeah. so I change the loop momentum yes. k, so you can take the first line. And replace k by l plus this stuff. Okay. And it seems to me that comes from the second term. I. No, 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 no. So, so what you get structurally, right? So k is roughly l plus lambda inverse r. Yes. And the rotation of vectors of vectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this there is l transpose. Sorry. In the first one, you have k transpose lambda k plus 2 r k. Now you take this l squared, right? So you have l squared is, um, so you have l minus, so you do that they get a third like r r r. Yeah, but they cancel. So there's two coming from the linear term and then one coming from the linear term. Yeah, you, you engineer this term exactly to cancel this one. Oh, okay, right. This is the completing oh, the square uh, part. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, exactly. It's only what we want. So, okay. yeah, what we wanted to do is exactly do a shift such that the linear part disappears. Okay, yeah, sure. But then you also get a term where you take both times this part. So you create a new constant part. And then you have two inverse matrices and the one non-inverse, and you are left with an inverse matrix. It's the same Gaussian integral where you get the inverse of the propagator if you do the, the final path integral, it's always the same thing. Okay. Each k or something like the lambda to the minus one r. Yes. So if I transform both, there is like a lambda times lambda to the minus one dot cancel. Which is a linear term? And then that's it. Okay, okay. Sorry, I didn't have to do it, so we don't have to talk about it. I mean, there, there, may be, there may be errors in the formulas, but at least roughly they should be correct. Yeah. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, you put all of this together, um, 
and then now the proposition, which we have essentially proved um, that this interval that I find here in momentum space is um, so now what is the integration method? We have to integrate over all of the Schwinger parameters, and we have one for each um, denominator. And then we have these x's raised to the power given by the exponents of the denominator that we introduced. We have to normalizing, sorry, this is all a. We have to normalizing gamma functions from the Schwinger trick. And then what is the integrand? Well, it's just e to the minus delta. And now I like to write delta as the ratio of these two polynomials. And so we know delta is not just any rational function. It's the ratio of two reciprocal polynomials. And then the denominator of the formula f u to the d over 2. So this comes from the Gauss integrals. So we had an x1 plus x2 plus x3 squared in our previous formula. Because we were two dimensions, and four dimensions. The four dimensions are always being squared. And in the case of the one loop graph, u just this is x1 plus x2. Um, so this is the general formula with the exponential. Then you can, again, exploit the homogeneity. Yeah, because homogeneity. So u is homogeneous. Now, f is homogeneous. It's easy to check. You can take the formulas and check that the degrees of the inverse of everything works out as the degrees of degree loop number plus one. Uh, then we have everything we need. But remember, when we did this transformation, we rescaled every variable, right? We introduced a new delta function, a new variable, and then we had to rescale x. We did this rescaling. Each variable goes to a variable times t, where t was this new variable that we created over. Now we have a change integration method, right? So instead of just getting one t for each dxa, we get t to the n over mA, depending on what mA is. And then the u, because it's homogeneous, it scales like t to the root number. So if you take the overall power of t that you get after the rescaling, this has a name, so we call it the superficial um, degree. Well, maybe I, should, I, I call it the superficial degree of convergence. Uh, and I will abbreviate by SEC, superficial degree of convergence. So this is defined as the sum of the uh, ends minus d over 2 times the root count. And this is the, the power counting, the, the exponent of t that you get when you do this change of yeah, Because f is one degree more than u, you get a t out of the exponent. And then the integral over t looks like something like t to the sdc minus 1, and then you have e to the minus t f over u. So you have a gamma integral for the t integration in this in the analog of the homogeneity stuff that we did earlier. Um, so you get a gamma function out of this. And now the exponential is gone, and you have the freedom to choose whatever delta function seems most convenient for your calculation.
it now gets testing speed less, and we have the f is the superficial degree of convergence, and we have the upgraded delta function. And then from this t integration, which gave you another gamma function, you have the factor superficial degree of convergence. Yeah, so this is now one integration less. There's a delta function here, and everything is rational, which is important for uh, things I want to talk about later this week. And then the last representation, which I want to mention, um, is due to Leon Pomeranski. So maybe let me just write it down. So let's say I is. Then gamma of t over 2 divided by gamma of t over 2 minus superficial degree of convergence. So a different gamma prefactor now. Now we have the same uh, integrations for the same measure of the Schwinger parameters. Now the integrand has the following form. We take the sum of the two polynomials and raise them to the power minus d over 2. So I guess this is maybe not as familiar as the other one. So the proof of this is very simple. So if you want to do this, you do the same thing. You just change, you, you introduce a delta function, t minus h of x and you rescale x by the t's, because now the funny thing is that u is so important to the loop number, this is degree hook number plus 1. If you do the change of variables, you get t to the loop number, and here you get t to the loop number plus 1. And then you have an integral to do, which turns out to be plus 1 the beta function, which gives you some gamma functions. So this is a good exercise if you're not familiar with this. Just take this to the same trick here, and then you can immediately reduce this expression to this expression. Um, so here in this formula, you integrate over all the variables. There's no delta function here. You have lost the homogeneity. This is the counterpart. But the appealing advantage of this formula is that you only have a single polynomial. Okay, so the, the message is that the family integral is the meta transform of a single polynomial to some power. So this has recently been used um, to get some insights about integration by perturbations to come mass integrals and there's other applications. So I just want to mention this. Um, actually quite, so I, I will probably talk about this when I say more. So these are, I would call them Schwinger parametric, you can call them finely parametric uh, integral representations of Feynman integrals. Um, the difference between Schwinger and Feynman is only if you do this extra integration towards, to get rid of this exponential. So you could also, from the get-go, start with the Feynman trick and not the Schwinger trick, but in the end, the parametric formulas are the same. And maybe I can just have two more minutes. Um, can I have two more minutes? Um, two more minutes. Um, so just one comment. So this was for a general scalar integral. Um, so for for tensor integral. You can do the, the same story as, as I illustrated at the beginning. We had a tensor integral in the first part of the talk. Um, and the upshot was that we had an integral which was a bit still here. So exercise in this example, this turns out to be a this is u. You just apply it to this to this three denominators, you get this u and f. So what is different? Well the difference is that this u is not raised to the power two, which would be d over two or maybe 2 minus 1, if you use this formula. But there is two extra powers of u, which you need to make it homogeneous because you have something enumerated. So, so the upshot is if you have any tensor integral, the only thing that changes is that you have the same um, integration measures, and then you have some numerator, some polynomial in the axis, and now we have u to the d minus 2, d over 2 minus s to plus some integer little n. Well, it's really hard to do to make two exponents. 
Yeah, sorry. The, the entire board or just cluster? It's getting hard. Okay. Yeah, some of this. Sorry. Um, but I hope you could take something away from that. Yeah, no. um, you have a tenth of the board. You get the same kind of digital representation you have this integral measure.
So spanning tree is a subset of the indices, which is spanning, connected, and a tree, uh, which doesn't have a loop. So suppose your graph is this thing. And you look at uh, just this subgraph here. And the problem is it's not spanning because there's two vertices which are not part of the graph. And so this is not spanning. Spanning means that your subgraph has to have all the vertices. And you say, okay, well, let's, let's take all the vertices then. So red is the subgraph. So let's take all the vertices in the subgraph and this edge. Then the problem with this is it's not connected. Because you have this part of the red graph and this part of the red graph, and there's no edge between the two. So this is not connected. Try to connect everything. You take all the vertices and take the edge. Now let's add this edge to connect this, and let's take this edge and then add this edge. So now it's connected and spanning, but the problem is this has a loop. <coughs> and here you can go around and loop in the red subgraph, so which means that this is not a tree, or you could also say it's not simply connected in a geometric sense. So what would be a tree? So all of these are non-trees and non-spanning trees. So what would be a spanning tree, for example, is this thing. The three edges that I just drew in slightly reddish color. Because they connect every vertex, um, they're connected and they don't have loops. So it's a minimal number of edges you need to, to connect the vertex to each other. Um, another thing you could do in this graph uh, would be, for example, to take this edge, this edge, this edge. Also tree. The 60 trees in this case, we can work them out to one. So what does this do in an example so far of a triangle that we had? I have to call this one, two, and three. Um, what is the U point on now? Well, what is the spanning tree in here? The spanning tree has to con contain two edges. Because you have to connect three vertices. So you can delete one edge, then you have a spanning tree, but that's all you can do. So you can take the spanning tree which contains one and two. So if you take one and two, you leave out three. So this spanning tree, T, gives you a contribution of X3 to you. And you can take also the, the spanning tree which has the edges 1 and 3 and misses out 2. This gives you x2. And you can take 2 and 3. And forget 1. This is x1. So this is how, in this very simple case of a one loop graph, you see. You get a tree for every edge you delete, so the u is just the sum of all the parameters. But already in the two, two loop cases gets more interesting, so an exercise you can do. Go back to the graph we did earlier. This one, right? So it had five edges. Notice that the external x or something that they don't matter for you. We have one, two, three, four, and five. So use this rule to check that the formula that I gave earlier for you is correct. So earlier we've written u as a determinant, and you can check whether or not this is the same. Um, and there's a similar formula for f. So f is u times the sum over all edges multiplied with Finger parameter for that times mass squared. And then you have a term similar to this one, where you sum up over trees, but pairs of trees. So these are called two forests, the so forest of two trees. Um, so in order to get a two forest, you have to leave one more edge. Let me only consider these terms that I haven't even written yet. 
but what you could do is you delete one wire. So suppose you only keep one. So you delete two edges. Now this means that your graph is not connected anymore, because it was connected and deleted another edge. Now you have two components. You have this component, which contains these two vertices, and you have this component. And now you look at the external momentum, right? So there can be an external momentum here. T can be uh, <coughs> momentum flow in this component is P prime, and the upper side they are the same. So there's a momentum that you can associate to such a two for us. Let's call this Q index F. You take this momentum squared, you take the product of all edges, not of the points. So in this case, this curve will contribute um, to this two for us here. F contributes to the curly F polynomial, the term where you have this momentum squared, so let's say minus P prime squared, times the two edges of the leaders, X squared, X squared. And we have more terms. So the exercise here is uh, take our triangle a bit earlier and show that the formula I gave for delta equals something is indeed F over U and compute that by these forms. So now I thank you very much for staying with me for so much longer. I hope you could read something. And yeah, any questions? Could you repeat the definition of a spanning two for us? Sorry. Yeah, sorry, this was uh, yeah, too fast. So, so the idea is, for a spanning tree, you take just enough edges to keep the graph together, connected. And for a spanning two for us, you delete one more edge. So now you have two components, which are two trees. So in this case, it's a bit degenerate, because one tree has just a vertex and no edge. Yeah, but this is a two for us, so I should have rather made this vertex here red. Yeah, so 
one tree is just an only trunk, and the other tree has an actual branch. So this is the two forest. Maybe in this case, for example, what would be a true forest? Um, so a nice true forest would, for example, be um, you take this one. Um, so you take these three vertices and these two edges, and not none of the rest. Uh, sorry, you, you take the vertex here, but that's it. Yeah, so you take, you delete these three edges, then you have one component, which has these two vertices. And then you can have a lonely component. An example where you wouldn't have a lonely component, in this case, this would be a two forest. Another two forest would be um, if you take this edge, and the red is really not very different. If you take this, this edge and this edge, so now you have two non trivial trees. Um, both of them have non trivial trees. And they, they, they cut the thing into two parts. And the momentum running through this cut is exactly p squared. So this would be the coefficient of the product of these three Schwinger parameters that you cut in that point. Very, very small force. Not only for 50 loops, and then big one. No, but because of the number of trees, it's always two trees. Yeah. So, any other questions? Let me just quickly. Is there like a canonical way to choose this h function in terms of u and f, or is it kind of like just? You can do whatever you want. There is no canonical choice. Well, I mean, if it's a x1 plus x2 plus whatever, yeah. plus then it's the canonical choice. I mean, from a geometric point of view, it's not more canonical than any other hyperplane. plane. But just so it makes the integral way easier to compute, like it was. Sorry? Like the, it was much easier to compute the integral, the, the vertex fraction. Well, that depends exactly on what situation you're yeah. in. So there are actually cases where people take a quadratic polynomial for h. So if you do a one loop interval, um, you have u and f, and if things work out, you can, I mean, you can either make u1 and the only integrate over f, you can also make f equal to 1. If you take the square root of f, if you have one loop, that's quadratic, so the square root of f is homogeneous, so you can also make f to 1. The problem is that in your integration domain, in Schwinger for me, it's not some weird thing that is constrained on a parabola, but actually, there are some cases where this is actually very useful because you have explicit problem. I mean, in, in uh, an actual integration processes, I think people, I don't know, it really depends on the situation. So for, for integration that I want to talk about a little bit, towards the end, in terms of iterate intervals, it's actually a nightmare. You never use x1 plus x2 plus xn because this completely screws up the whole process. So there, what, what's most convenient is to pick one variable, set it to one. Just pick h to be some cleverly chosen variable. Um, and then you get the rest. So it really depends on the situation and what you want to achieve. But it, uh, it has to be homogeneous of degree one, right? It has to be homogeneous of degree one. And it can be homogeneous of anything, you're basically some power of your from these of degree one. So. Yeah, sorry. I'm not. Uh, in the two forest, uh, the last one you do, what would be the Q corresponding to that? Two yes, forests? in this one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there are three ways to define them. They all get the same result. Um, so you have two trees. So you can look at all the external momenta that go into, that go into one of the trees. So let's say the super general situation. Suppose we have four momenta here. Suppose there's four legs here on this graph. Yeah? like a slash box integral or something like that. And if you do this, then you can look at this one tree. So this is tree one, this is tree two. And then the momentum running into t one would be p one plus p two. That's momentum, external momentum going into t one. You also have an external momentum going into t two, which is p three plus p four. But luckily, by the momentum conservation, the squares are not the same. You could also ask, what is the momentum running through the cut? Yeah, it's again the same. So whatever way you prefer is the So if you do the exercise for the triangle graph at the beginning, it does already something happening because you have one like external legs, so some terms cancel. So to check that you get this delta that I've written here, 
if you can if you can confirm that the numerator is f in this case, then you have absolutely. So this uh, Lee Pomeranski form, it looks kind of weird to me, partly from the point of view of the analyticity of the external variables. So like in the standard representation, mm -hmm. everything's fine apart from some endpoint stuff when you're in the Euclidean region because half is positive. And then if you start to move into the Minkowski region, you can read off some of the analyticity from where F vanishes. Yes. But then you go and look at the Lee Pomeranski formula, and it looks like nothing particularly interesting is happening when f vanishes. It's when f plus u vanishes. But that must be a fake somehow. Well, the problem is that f vanishes, then the decay of u plus f in infinity becomes different. Okay, so it's the damping of infinity that gets messed up when, yeah. when in the Lee Pomeranski formula. So it's always been when you look at it's, it's sort of in the final parameterization. Of course, it's always in some compact region where, well, by definition, where f vanishes. Well, uh, Yes, so sort of, well. <coughs> even if, if it vanishes, you can have divergences just, just, just from the boundary divergences of you, which might have been cured by F or whatever. Of course, when you really in the Cox expect F might be negative, I mean, then how makes it sense? So maybe it's from a physical point of view, I agree, it's a bit counterintuitive to have. I mean, not homogeneous, which is a nice scaling degree and masses and all that, and you won't do it. But from a mathematical point of view, it's just very damn polynomial, you take its mother transform. Um, so there is an appeal to that.